Welcome into Eastern Pain and the Talk, the Thursday edition with Mike Hornby. Rob is still off. He won't be back till Monday, so you have to deal with me, folks. I'm going to welcome in Delegate Height. Thanks for joining me once again. Good morning. Good to be here. Award-winning best-selling author, Mr. John Gilstrap. Welcome. Good morning. How are you fine gentlemen doing this morning? Doing well. I'm are doing are well. you happy that the heat wave is over? Very. Even yes. though it was 72 degrees at 6.30 this morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, it's summertime. You know, it's, it's July in West Virginia. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be right. hot and humid. Real quick on J.D. Vance's uh, speech last night. Or... I, wa I want to hang out with Mamaw. <laughs> uh, that makes two of us. Uh, Mamma seems cool. Yeah. <laughs> Any other uh, speakers you were impressed with last night, Mike? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, his his granddaughter was one of the highlights of this convention. I think uh, she made him uh, look human, mm -hmm. um, and and gave it. And he looked touch. human. Yes. Okay. During, yeah, he looked like he emotional. Was emotional. Yeah. yeah. So I think she did a great job and uh, uh, did a lot for him. Right. Don Jr. Certainly spun up the crowd, did yeah. a good job. He, and his, yeah. It, it, he's gotten more impressive the longer he's done this. I think, you know, in the beginning he was just dad, dad, dad. But he's become pretty polished, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. And I heard an interview, and I, I forget who did the interview. Uh, it, was, it was a Fox News interview with Eric Trump, who is also very impressive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very angry, actually. He spun up. That is the first time I've heard him with a lot of emotion. Well, I, I've been impressed with the uh, convention as a, as a whole. I think it's done the uh, Republican Party as a whole pretty well as far as public publicity goes. And, and, the, and the look, I thought the whole thing has been pretty pretty darn good. You know, I don't know. I, I've taken a different look at it. I, I thought, you know, at times it's been <laughs> pretty ho-hum, boring. Now, when, when Donald Trump first made his entrance and, yeah. and appearance and stuff, it was electric. You know, everybody was anticipating that first uh, first public event yeah. after the shooting. Um, so I think that was big. But, you know, the speakers, I've been listening to some of the speakers, and I've been like, eh, okay. You know, <laughs> so there's only been a few that have really um, really hit a nerve right. and, and energized me. So, yeah, I don't know. It'll be oh. interesting to see how, how they come off of this convention and the fact that it was so early because, you know, you, you still right. got three months to go, and the Democrats get to have their convention. So, you know, how much are they going to? Uh, how much of a bump will Trump get out of this? We shall see. I'm going to uh, switch to the phone line now. I want to introduce Julia Wynn from Code.org. I got to meet Julia. Julia, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. I got to meet Julia uh, this last session. She actually did a presentation right before the end of uh, Crossover Day. And she did a presentation on computer science and the effects that computer science have on uh, kids and how the, the popular. And I was so impressed with that presentation. I, I put a bill together. We managed to get the, uh, the bill through the House side. Uh, but unfortunately, um, we did not... We went to conferees with the Senate, and uh, they added. They did the Senate thing and added a bunch of stuff on their side. <laughs> uh, so we didn't get it through, but I am all on board for next session. Julia, tell us a little bit about Code.org and what we are planning to do uh, for the next session. Yeah, of course. Well, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, so Code.org is a national nonprofit, and our mission is to make sure every student in every school has access to computer science and education, including in West Virginia, of course. Um, and so to do that, we do work with states to pass policies to make sure that happens and make sure that schools have the resources to effectively do that. Um, and then we also have free curricula in computer science. So all that is on our website, open source. Uh, teachers can log in, students can log in, parents can log in um, and have access to computer science courses anywhere from elementary level CS all the way up to AP level computer science. Um, so that's a little bit about what we do. Um, and we worked on this bill uh, this year, and like you said, you're, you're all ready to do it again next year, and we hope to get across the finish line. Um, so basically what the bill would do is require that all high school students in West Virginia at least take half 
a credit of computer science in order to graduate. Um, this is something that we're actually seeing gain a lot of momentum in states across the country. Um, I think they're realizing that computer science skills is just a critical part of being a successful contributor to our society today. I mean, technology drives everything in our society. And really that makes computer science, you know, just as important as, as math or science. I mean, if we're gonna say students should learn about photosynthesis and our government systems, you know, they should absolutely be learning how to use a computer to solve problems, um, you know, what an algorithm is, and especially with the way AI is expected to impact society. Everyone's talking about AI. Um, and I think, you know, state policy plays a really important role in making sure that, that kids can have some AI literacy going into careers these days. John? Uh, good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is John Gilstrap. So when you talk about computer science and a, and a half a credit, I'm not sure what that means. I'm not sure it's, it, it matters. But there's computer literacy, like how to actually how, how to make programs work. And then there's actually putting yeah. ones and zeros together and create programming. What, what are you talking about when you talk about um, computer science? Yeah, great question. Um, so, and a lot of people do confuse computer literacy with computer science and, you know, that that's understandable. And I think that's why we sometimes have, you know, so few kids taking computer science. They aren't actually sure what it is. Uh, but computer literacy is basically knowing how to use a computer. Um, so many kids these days don't need a lot of help uh, to already be able to do that. Uh, but computer science is really a more holistic study of computers and that includes how they work, their software, their hardware, how they're designed um, and also their impact on society. So when we look at a high school course, um, we're usually talking about, you know, what makes strong internet networks. Um, of course, there's the programming component um, and that's a, a pretty big component, especially at the high school level. Um, kind of more complex, like debugging and troubleshooting. Um, you talk about digital information, you talk about cybersecurity, um, and really a lot of it is collaborating to create and refine artifacts on the computer or on programs that solve community problems. Um, and kids are, you know, they're building apps, they're building websites, and that's what makes kids love computer science so much because it's incredibly you know, project-based, hands-on learning that's really relevant to their lives. Um, and so coding is a, is a sizable part of it, um, but also it's about computational thinking, you know, breaking down problems into smaller parts. It's about problem solving and, and being creative, but also analytical. And so it really just helps kids in other subjects in their school and there's data to show that. Um, but it also helps them just, you know, be better thinkers. And I've actually talked to students, you know, in, in states in the region and they say that they are realizing that they just think about problems differently after taking computer science. And I've heard from teachers too that there are students that are traditionally disengaged, you know, in maybe a, a core subject like, you know, math or, or science, but they are engaged in computer science and I think that's because students understand the relevance for their lives and they're excited about the content you know it's not it's not our mother's computer science where it's just the zeros and ones you were talking about anymore I think a lot of the curriculum providers not just us but there's a lot of good content out there um, and I think they're making it increasingly relevant for students Michael Hyde. good morning Julia um, so as a delegate, I, when we hear things like this, when we look at, at new bills that are coming up and, and we're sort of questioning, um, should we make this a law? I have to question why we would do this and make it mandatory. Um, we're, we're struggling right now with kids who can't read and write in school. They can't do simple addition and subtraction. Um, and, and now we want to mandate that we do computer coding or computer science. And so why would we make this a mandatory and not just an elective that those kids who show the aptitude for this kind of study may want to take rather than everybody? Yeah, so we do get that question a lot and, and I understand where it's coming from. I think it's important to realize that, you know, 
computer science, we are at the point with computer science where we were with, you know, social studies 100 years ago. We're just now realizing that this is something that should already be in our curriculum, but it's not. And so we need to update what we're teaching kids to make sure that they have the knowledge to get these in-demand jobs in our economy. And I mean, a lot of the top industries in West Virginia, you know, when we're talking about whether it's healthcare, energy, agriculture, these increasingly require computer science and technology skills. And you guys have had a lot of really exciting, you know, investment, you know, most recently LG Electronics newly announced technology business development venture and and all those jobs are going to require these updated skills and definitely computational thinking skills. And so I think it's about workforce. Um, it's about making sure that every student has access to this kind of education. Right now, what we see is, you know, the students, to your point, that kind of already have been exposed or may already be showing, you know, some proclivity for it. They are going to go ahead and take it. But everyone else who we know can do well in the subject, um, they are just not going to take it. And at this point, you know, it should be required, again, because of the workforce needs, but also just for the basic skills that that these kids need. And I will say, you know, the legislation that Delegate Hormi introduced um, has a five-year runway before students are going to need to graduate with this. And you know, so, one of the other yeah. issues I, I would have is... Um, when we look at teachers around, especially in the state of West Virginia, we have a, um, a a problem with having enough teachers. How do you find teachers that have the the knowledge to to teach a subject like this, or are you going to have to come in and educate a bunch of teachers to be able to teach this to the students? Yeah, so there's good professional development already happening in West Virginia. Um, So there are professional development providers and essentially at the high school level, uh, usually what it takes to train a teacher to teach computer science is about a week of professional development um, for that course. And so they can do that usually over the summer. But I will note too, West Virginia actually already has 78% of its public high schools offering computer science. So there's a solid foundation of teachers there already, already teaching this subject. It's just a matter of getting kids to understand what it is and getting them in those classes. And and also to try and get more female students to be uh, taking these classes, correct, Julia? Is that... Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, there's only about a fifth of the students taking right now in West Virginia are women. I think the part of this that concerns me is the mandatory nature of it. Um, I'm a writer, and and I write novels and I write screenplays. If I want to make a film, I don't have to, have to know how to build a camera. So if if somebody wants to build websites... Websites are graphic arts, websites are language, websites are imagery, There's websites are a lot of different things, and you can, and, and there are different elements to putting these together. And I think you had a good analogy when you talked about social studies. Social studies as, as a, a category is history and government and political science and geography, and uh, so if we're going to have a mandatory uh, group of courses, I think as a taxpayer, not as a delegate, but as a, because I'm not a delegate, (laughs) as a taxpayer, I would be much more supportive of a classification of coursework as opposed to mandated computer science. Because let's be honest, not everybody cares about this stuff. And I would, I would, you know, going back, projecting me as a much younger person doing this, I, I don't want to build the camera. I would much rather be making the film and understanding how to to, to go through the filmmaking process and let could, somebody else build the camera. You could apply that to languages. Uh, what's the need of a second language as a credit? It's it's a half credit, so it's one course, one mm-hmm. semester. Um, so that getting involved, but it's a zero sum game. Mike. Yeah, you know, it's it's one credit, Sounds this one like or that a book one. Title, right? Sorry? So Julia, like talk- a book title, right? And it's zero sum game. Yeah, <laughs> Julia, what? Um, and I was. What other states have uh, implemented this, and has there has there been any results yet? Yeah, so there are ten states uh, that have already enacted this, and they 
kind of run the gamut across the country. So um, Indiana, Rhode Island, Nevada, uh, South Carolina, and again, there's 10 total. Um, and the two that have actually gone on to implement it already, because again, usually we see about a five-year runway between when the legislation passes and when it goes into effect. Um, they have basically showed that it goes well. So South Carolina and Nevada, um, both of them actually had, Nevada had about 57% of its public high schools offering when they passed the bill. So actually way less than West Virginia currently has now. And they got up to 83% in two years. South Carolina had the same thing. They were up to 92% in two years. So they you know, we're right there even after two years where they needed to be to, to get almost to 100% of offering. And what we've seen was that the outcomes that we know will happen do happen. So, you know, South Carolina had more female students taking computer science um, in the first year after they started, you know, the requirement than Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, and combined. Um, so that's huge. I'll mention too, there's actually a local school district in Illinois that also has had a graduation requirement in effect for um, a number of years. And they actually saw students' grades in computer science that required class be higher than in other subjects. Um, and girls were actually doing doing better in it than boys. Um, so again, this is, and I think, you know, to what in, you were you were saying before it it comes down to what's in the course and I think understanding what's in the course I mean are you working you know a lot of people are working with data analysis in their jobs or some kind of software or some kind of thing that requires understanding of how to use a computer to solve problems and especially with the way AI as I've already mentioned you know is impacting it's supposed to impact 44 percent of workflows in the next four years so that's going to be almost half of folks and that's number just is just going to go up so what we've seen is this implementation process is achievable for schools. Um, students are showing the outcomes that we know they can show. Um, so, you know, I'm excited to see West Virginia get there and, and hopefully get the same outcomes for their students. John? Yeah, I, I really, I have not. It, it's, okay. It'll be interesting to see how, how this turns out, I guess. Mm -hmm. Julie, we're going to wrap this up. I want to thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. I look forward to working with you. Um, thank you. And we will see where we go from here. Great. And thanks for all the questions, guys. <laughs> thank, you. Good. thank you. Appreciate it. Take care. <laughs> Take care.